morning. How's everybody this morning? Cool, crisp, fall air. Everything's fallen. Trees are turning colors. Y'all have this time of the year? You got pumpkin everything at your house? All right. Have you been to Lowe's or Walmart and the Christmas trees are knocking over the Halloween candy? Come on. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? Uh, it's that wonderful time. We're good, all right? Let me, um, I want to introduce you this morning. If you don't know me, my name's Tony. I get to be one of the pastors here and get to share this morning and wrap up our series. Our series that we've been on for the last five weeks is entitled Waiting for When, and then a recognition that someday is, is, is now. Um, there's no sense in waiting any longer. I opened up this series um, five weeks ago with an apology. Um, and, and I want to reiterate the fact that the apology was this. Um, I've bought into it over the years, been in ministry for a long time. Churches have bought into this. And there is a culture that seems to exist in churches that if I, um, if I just show up or if I'm going to volunteer, if I only volunteer one time a month, if, if I, if with my finances, if I just, you know, tip a little bit or, or do a little bit, all these different things, there is this idea in church culture, and I've, I've unfortunately been a part of it, to only give God our leftovers. And, and, and I want to see that change. You see, God doesn't want us to wait on anything. God is saying, and he's been saying throughout this entire series, he's been saying since the beginning of time, but he's been teaching us through this entire series that waiting for when is just an excuse that we often get. It's just an excuse that we often give and we often say, I'll do this when. I'll make my marriage better when. I'll love my husband better. I'll love my wife better. I'll, I'll be a better parent when. I'll, I'll trust God more with my finances when. I'll plan for the future when. We, we constantly live in this kind of a world. And, and, and maybe that's something you're familiar with, maybe not. L let, me, let me just kind of back up just a second. I, I want to share with you the things that we've talked about over the last few weeks. We started off by asking a question. Are you all in? Are, are you all in or are you just partially following Jesus? Now, now listen, I get it. Some of you, you're not really on this Jesus thing. You're not even really sure what, about Christians and you don't want to be one and they all seem to be hypocrites and I've heard that before and I just said to somebody earlier this morning, I said, you know what? We are all hypocrites. Come on in. You'll fit in great. It'll be good, all right? Um, but we asked the question, are you going to be all in or are you just going to be partially following God? We followed that up by, by making the fact known that we're all on a path to somewhere. Are you on a path that leads to the destination where God wants you? You can ask that question in every relationship and every place in your life. The next week we ask this question, what excuses are you using to not show up to God's invitation? Kyle, if you remember, he shared that message and he had a table out here with a, a big plastic turkey and all the different stuff out here and he said, God's inviting you to the banquet. God's giving you an invitation. Quit making excuses and show up and follow Jesus. And then last week, Kyle did a message and he s talked about the lies that we tell ourselves. Do you know that you lie to yourself more than any other person lies to you? See, believing those lies doesn't change the truth. Just because we believe a lie doesn't change the truth. And Jesus tells us that the truth sets us free. So this morning, my goal is to take all the previous four weeks and to wrap up the idea and help you recognize that... Um, that if you are still saying, I will one day, I'm waiting for, I have a broken relationship with a brother, a sister, a mom, a dad, a spouse, a friend at work, and, and I'll make it right when, and then you can fill in the blank. I'll trust God when. I, I'll volunteer when. I'll serve God when. Well, my goal today is to be very practical and to be very, very simple. By the way, it's always my goal to be simple because I'm kind of simple. And it's a little bit easier to understand that way. Matter of fact, let me give you some, uh, oh, some simple ideas this morning just to kind of get you, uh, your appetite a little bit wet. Let me give you some statements. Maybe you've heard these kind of things before in, in being practical and simple. Tell me if you have or you haven't, all right? You heard this one before? Don't take life too seriously because you're not getting out of it alive. You ever heard that one before? All right. Um, never put off till tomorrow what you can do today, unless you're a procrastinator, and then always put off till tomorrow what you don't want to do today. All right. If at first you don't succeed, 
Try, try. Y'all are good at this, all right? And then I think Mark Twain, Mark Twain was probably the original one who was quoted with saying these sort of statements. Um, there are two kinds of people in the world, those who make your life easier and those who make it harder. Or here's one that I found this week I thought was pretty cool. When you're in jail, a good friend will come bail you out. A best friend will be sitting next to you saying, man, that was fun. Uh, yeah, all right, anyway. More to Mark Twain stuff. Two kinds of people in the world, some willing to work and the rest are willing to let them. You may work with some of those people. There's two kinds of people in the world, people who accomplish things and people who claim to have accomplished things. Yeah. Well, not to be overly simplistic or, or just, I just want to be simple but not overly. Let me just give you a statement, all right? There's two kinds of people in the world. Two kinds of people in the world, and this is where we're going to take off for this message. I'm just going to be brief. I'm only going to preach out of three verses this morning. If you've got a Bible, you want to turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. It's, going to be, it's not going to be short, but it's going to be simple, all right? So here it is. Put that up there for me. There's two kinds of people in the world. Those who make a difference today and those who wait for when. So you have an option. Oh, it just got really interesting. You have a choice. You can say, I will make this change in my life when, fill in the blank. I will follow Jesus when, fill in the blank. Maybe you're not somebody who fully believes in God or is following Jesus yet, and you've come up with the idea of I'll give my life to Jesus when, fill in the blank. There's so many things that we look at in this, but the simplistic idea is that you've only got, you're only going to be one of two people. You're either going to be someone who makes a difference today in your life and in the life of others, or you're going to be somebody who consistently makes the excuses. You're going to be somebody who always gives the answer of, I can't do this because, and then ultimately your because becomes your cause, and your cause becomes the narrative for your life that says, I just can't do anything with God because it hasn't happened the way I wanted it to yet. Well, what if, what if, now, I've, I've been in ministry a long time, and um, I believe in Jesus. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. I've given my life to him. So I believe what I'm getting ready to say to be true. And you may not, but what if, what if there really is a creator God? What if there really is a heavenly father who really did create the universe, really did put the stars into space and, and the planets and then created people? He created some of you with blue eyes and some of you with green eyes and some of you with brown eyes and some of you keep wearing colored contacts and God's going, go back to the way I'm... Anyway, I don't know. What, what if there really is? What if there really is a God? And that God really created you with purpose. He really created you on purpose and with purpose because he wanted something out of your life. The Apostle Paul believed that to be true. I don't know if you know who Paul is, but uh, there might be some of you sitting out there this morning. It's like what I said earlier, Christians are just a bunch of hypocrites. I don't like Christians. Well, you can not like Christians, but Paul really hated Christians. See, before he became Paul, his name was Saul. And he used to travel all over the known world with these letters from the, from the church in Jerusalem, or excuse me, from the temple in Jerusalem, that he could go out and he could have Christians arrested and tortured and some even put to death. And Paul made this conversion. God got a hold of him and he changed. And then Paul went from hating Christians to becoming probably the most famous Christian that ever lived. Wrote the majority of what we call the New Testament. One particular letter that he wrote to a church in a town called Ephesus, kind of a big city, kind of a port city that had a lot of coming and going and trade and all the things going on. Paul wrote this letter. And, and I want to help you. See if we can, um, I don't know, see if maybe we can identify ourselves. Because I think so often when we say I'm waiting for when, we're not really recognizing that God created us. And that you really have only one first marriage. You really only have one time to raise those kids that God's given you. You really only have one time to be an influence in the world around you with the neighbors you have and the people you work with. And if you're constantly saying, I'm waiting for when... You might be cheating God out of the purpose he put in your life. 
So let, me, let me read some of these words of Paul. They're going to put them up on the screen for me. Again, I'm going to use three simple verses this morning. You're probably going to be familiar with them if you've been around church. Throw that up there for me. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, you're probably familiar with this verse. Have you read it yet? How many of you are familiar with this verse? Yeah, you're familiar with it. Just say I'm familiar with it. Good, let me do it, all right? Since you're familiar, I'll make it quick. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So Paul is giving and making us and helping us understand and writing this verse to uh, to the church in Ephesus. And he's saying this, that it is you are only a Christian. You are only a, a, a life that has been given to God, only by grace. You can't earn it. Now, I, I, there is a lot of people, and maybe you're one of them, maybe not. I feel like we're, you're just too smart to think this way, but maybe you're there. I don't know. I, I don't want to do that one way or another, but I think a lot of people think that there's like this giant set of scales somewhere up in heaven, and, and you're hoping to get there one day, and God's going to have these scales, and he's going to say, I'm going to put all the bad things you did on one side, and I'm going to put all the good things you did on the other side, and, and there's so many people. Man, I've heard athletes and politicians and people all the time when asked, and they're like, man, I hope one day when I stand, I hope I I hope, I hope one day. Nope, listen, you're going to stand there one day and there won't be scales because if you measured it out, your good will never outweigh your bad, but somehow we think that way. But Paul says that it's a gift of God because if you could somehow do more good than bad, you would be walking around for all of eternity with your head, your head so big from bragging and your chest puffed out so much that you'd miss God. So Paul wanted to set the record clean and clear that it is only by Jesus, only by his grace, and only through faith that you can be saved. You all agree with that? Cool. I don't care if you agree or not. It's the truth. I want you to agree. I want you to understand it. Well, Paul uses this as kind of a setup for the next words. And I'm going to spend the rest of our time, you can set your clock by it, not by the time I'm going to be done because nobody knows, but by what I'm going to share the rest of the time. I'm going to use one verse, the following verse, and we're going to dig into it because God created us with purpose. And every single time we say, I'm going to wait until we're missing what God has. So look at this word. They're going to put it up there for me in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Look at this right here. For we are God's handiwork. Everybody say handiwork. Okay, handiwork, another word for that is creation. We are God's creation. God created you with a purpose, for a purpose, on purpose. He's put you here on this earth because he wants something accomplished in your life. God has created you. And oh, by the way, everything that is created is a means to an end. You were created for something, and it is a means to an end, ultimately to give glory to God. Let let me see if I can illustrate it and give you uh, just sort of a simple illustration. Anybody know what this is? Good job. I'm glad nobody said pliers, but it's better than first service, all right? All right, so this is a hammer. What do you use a hammer for? What's that? Everything. everything. Electrical work. All right, no, 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 not everything, all right? Um, you, you use a hammer for driving nails. You know, you've heard it said, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. All right, you use a hammer for driving nails. What about the back side of this? What do you use that for? Pulling nails out. So if I said, what is the purpose of a hammer? You would say, it's for hammering things and removing nails and fixing mistakes or tearing stuff down. Except, everything that's created is created with an, ends in my, an end in mind. Part of the purpose of a hammer is to drive nails. You ever been to the Biltmore House? Anybody ever been to the Biltmore House? Raise your hand real high if you've been to the Biltmore House. I love the Biltmore House. I, I'm a carpenter by trade. I was taught as a carpenter as a kid. been a carpenter most of my life in one form or fashion. And I love going to the Biltmore House. One of my favorite things to do is walk into the rooms where there's like 12 stacked crown molding or, or baseboard or these doors. And they built that entire place without one electrical miter saw or skill saw. They did it all by hand. They had one of these. But they did it all this way. Created with an ends an end in mind. You may say a hammer is for nailing or removing stuff, but ultimately, you know what a hammer's for? It's for building things. It's for creating something. It's not just about the nail. It's not just about pulling the nail. It's about what it's going to ultimately do. 
That's the way God created you. You are God's handiwork, God's creation, and everything about you, God put it in place. And every single time that you give the excuse, that you give the because, that you give the reason that is truly just a because and an excuse, you're saying, God, I know you created me, but not right now. And you're missing so let, let, let me dig a little bit further. For we are God's handiwork or God's creation. And then look what Paul does. He says, created in Christ Jesus. Everybody say in. All right. Anytime, a little, little, little bit of uh, helping you understand the Bible a little bit. Anytime in Paul's writings in the New Testament, Paul wrote, um, let's see, Acts, Romans, 1st and Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and Thessalonians, 1st and Timothy, Titus, some people think Hebrews. Paul wrote a lot of letters in the New Testament. Anytime that Paul puts a statement and says, in Christ Jesus, he's gone from you were created to this if you are a Christian. See, this in Christ Jesus means you are part of the new covenant of Christ. It means that you are now someone who is created in Christ. The Old Testament has become fulfilled. Jesus, whenever he speaks, spoke of the new covenant, he always speaks of it in this mindset. It is wrapped up in two simple statements. You ready? You ready? You know these. You've heard me say them a thousand times. Love God and love others. Can y'all say that with me? Love God and love others. That's what you were created for. So when Paul says we are God's handiwork cre or creation created in Christ Jesus, he is narrowing this down even more. That means a minute ago, if you're not a Christian, you were going, yeah, I was created on purpose. Now I'm just talking to Christians. and You're like, good, he's not talking to me anymore. But if you're a Christian this morning, you were created in Christ Jesus. Now, <laughs> Now comes the fun part. You ready for the next part of this verse? Go ahead and put that up on the screen for me, if you will. Created in Christ Jesus to do, what are those words? Good works. Good works. You were created in Christ. How many of you at your house, if you're married or whatever, how many of you like to do to-do lists? How many of you are to-do list people? You put to-do list up? You had, I mean, you've been married for like 20 years. Your wife, you put, she put a to-do list on the refrigerator. You're not doing it. It's just a joke, all right? But she's got a to-do list up somewhere. Anybody got one in your house? To-do list? Your to-do list people? Some of you are like, no, because I ain't doing it anyway. All right. God has a to-do list for us. We are put on this earth as Christians to no longer make excuses. When, when God says, I created you, I, you're my handiwork, you're created in Christ Jesus, it's to do good works. Not good works for you, good works for others. That's that part of loving God and loving others. God put you here on this earth so that you could be a blessing to others, so you can point others to Jesus, so you can help other people find Jesus. God's to-do list is very, very simple. Love God, love others do it. And then Paul wraps up these verses this way. He does it really, really cool and it's kind of hard. Are you ready? We are God's handiwork, God's creation created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is so powerful. God prepared in advance. What if, what if God has a plan for your life? Paul believed it to be true. I believe it to be true. Jesus said it was true, which by the way, if you're ever curious what team you should be on, Team Jesus or not Team Jesus, anybody who says, I'm going to die, and he does, I'm going to raise again, and then he raises again, I I'm on his team. I, I want to be on his team. Whatever jersey he's wearing, I want that one. So, if you want to be on Team Jesus and you recognize that you were created for a purpose and you were created on purpose, why, why do we constantly say, I'll do it when? I'll show up when? I'll trust God with my finances when I get my bills paid off, I buy the new car, I pay the boat off. I, I'll, I'll volunteer and serve other people when I have the time. 
I will treat my spouse with respect when... Why are we so quick to give excuses? Why are we so quick to do that? See, I'll put this up on the screen for me, if you will. Look at, look at this statement. As followers of Jesus, waiting for when, it can just become a subtle way of us resisting what God has created us to do. Waiting for when is just an excuse. And every single time in your life that you say, God, I'm not going to do this until. I am waiting for when. God's going, but I created you. I know exactly when and what. And I just want your heart. I just want you to follow me. I just want you to give it to me. And every time, every single time we say to God, I'm going to wait. It's, it, and it's this. You say, well, how, what does that look like in your life? Well, it looks like this. I'll forgive them when they... That's, that's, that's an excuse. I, I, I'll, I, I'll forgive them. I, Kyle did it last week when he finished up his message. He got extremely vulnerable and he talked about this battle in his life with health and eating right and exercise and all this stuff. It, it's this kind of thing. I, I will start taking care of my body when... I have my first heart attack? What do you want to go with? I, I will treat what God did in me when I will love other people when I'll serve other people. I, I'll when and we're just missing. We're just missing what God has. So I, I, wanna, I told you at the beginning, I'm going to be very practical and I'm going to be very, very simple and I'm going to wrap up this entire series in the next few minutes and I'm going to give you some things. I, I read it a few weeks ago or a month or so ago and, I, and as I wrote it down, I went, man, this is going to fit so well in today's message and I, I, I'm going to take everything that we just said in these verses and I'm going to be very, very practical and you're going to help me out. This is what you're going to do. Everybody take out your cell phone. If you've got a cell phone, um, just take it out, hold on to it. Um, I'm hoping you've got a smartphone. If you've got a dumb phone, it's going to take you a long time to do what I'm asking you to do, but, but give it a shot, all right? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to start a text message, go to your text messages, and I, I, I use a, a Apple because Jesus created them, and you might have a droid, and that's fine, but I did find out that droids will do the same thing. So I want you to go to your text messages, and I want you to start a text to yourself. Okay, I, you, you, some of you are like, can you do that? It's revolutionary. You can send yourself notes and reminders. It's all kind of great stuff. So I want you to start a text to yourself. Start typing in your name. Your name will come up and then start a text. Because I want you to text the things to yourself that we're getting ready to do. Because if you are somebody who has constantly said, I will wait until when, I will give the excuse, I will do this, I'm going to ask you to do something. And you may do it this week. It may be an exercise that you continually come back to because we're all good at giving excuses. We're all good at putting off what we need to do. So here's what I want you to do. You're going to start the text message. Now, do not hit send until I tell you to. All right? So everybody agree with me. I'm not going to hit send until Tony tells me to. All right, you're agreeing. All right, cool. All right? So you're going to start this text message. I'm going to want you, it's going to be really, really simple, okay? I want you to type this word in. Type in this word. They're going to put it on the screen. Identify. Identify. That's, that's the only word I want you to type in there right now. Put in identify, and this is what it means. Identify what you've been waiting for. What is it? What is it in your life? I, I've been, I've given you several. I've been waiting for, you know, I've been waiting to be generous until. I've been waiting to forgive that person until. I've been waiting to make this relationship right until. I've been waiting to be the kind of husband or the kind of wife I need to be until. I've been, whatever it may be, whatever that thing is that crosses your mind that says, I am waiting for when. Just, just, you, you got it. You need to identify it. You need, now listen. This was the simple one. From here on out, you have a big possibility of hurting your own feelings if you do the things I'm getting ready to ask you to do, all right? It's simple to identify them. You know what your excuses are, don't you? Don't you? I know what my excuses are. You know why I know what my excuses are? Because I've been giving them for my entire life. So identify what they are. Here's the second one. Investigate. Everybody say investigate. Oh, this is the law and order Dun, dun, dun. I did it wrong. What's the law and order theme? Somebody hum it. No, don't. All right. Invest. Somebody just did. Don't do that. All right. Investigate. Investigate. The reason I put the word investigate is because I want you to do this. I want you to investigate and say, what's the real reason? Begin to ask why you are constantly given 
excuses? Why do I immediately go to that excuse? Why is it that every single time someone says, hey, we really need somebody to serve in this area, you go, oh, well, I mean, I can't because uh, wrong shoes. Uh, I, why don't you start investigating the excuse? Because here's what will happen. Oh, man, this is hard. When you start to investigate the excuses, you're going to start figuring out why you do things. Why is it so scary for me to tell people about Jesus? Well, because I'm afraid. I ain't afraid of nothing. Yeah, you are. Identify that. Identify it. Investigate it. Figure out why you consistently give that excuse. So, one, you're going to identify. You're going to identify the excuse, the reason why you keep saying, I'll wait until. Then you're going to investigate it. You're going to find out the why behind the why. You're going to go, why deep down am I somebody that just does this and consistently does this and consistently says, I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait. Here's the third one. Again, you go hurt your own feelings. Number three, own up. Write the words, own up. And that means own up to your own reasoning for why you're given the excuse and why you're waiting. Because the truth is, God created you for purpose and on purpose. And you need to own up. Even so much of maybe you need to, after you've identified the things that are excuses in your life, and you've investigated them and found the real reason, stand in front of a mirror and go, this is something I do. And I am owning up to it. Do it. You, you might hurt your feelings, but you might get a good step. And here's the next one. You're typing these things. You have not hit send yet, all right? Here's your next one. Ask yourself this question. What do I lose? This one's hard. What do I lose if I continue to wait? What do, what do I give up? What am I missing? You know, I've talked to I've, I've talked to couples over the years that are struggling in their marriages, and I've asked this question. See, I don't know if you know this or not, but statistically, if you come from a, a home of divorce, you have a higher percentage of being divorced. And then if you get divorced, your kids have an even higher percentage of being divorced. So a lot of times when I'm sitting with couples that are struggling and they're trying to make the decision and they're trying to, oh, they can come up with excuses. Listen, there's a ton of excuses. First off, in case you don't know this, in marriage, you married a sinner. Did you know that? Did you know that every person in this room that's married married a sinner? And before you get too cocky, your spouse married a sinner too, all right? So we could always come up with excuses and reasons why not to make it work. I try to do this with couples. I, I try to just sit with them for a minute and go, hey, what are you giving up if you decide to split up? I want you to fast forward to your kid's wedding when it's you and their stepmom and their, or their stepdad and who's walking who down the aisle. I want you to fast forward to retirement when you want your grandkids to come visit you, but you only get your grandkids half the time because they got to visit their mom and their new dad and their dad and their new mom, and you're only going to get... Listen, what are you giving up? What are you giving up? What are you giving up when it comes to your finances by saying, I, I, I'm not going to trust God. I'm not going to give God anything back. I'm not going to trust what God has for me. What are you giving up? You're giving up peace and security and an understanding that if I have faith in God, God can do more with what I give than I could ever think of doing if I keep it. What am I giving up? So with every excuse that you've got, everything that comes across your mind, every time you say, I'll wait until, ask yourself the question, what do I lose? You might lose out on peace and security. You might lose out on a family in the future. There's a lot of things you may lose out on. But ask yourself the question, what do I lose out if I don't? And then when we do that, you know what often happens is um, we avoid regrets. I don't know if you know what a regret is, but regret is coming to the end of something and saying, I should have, I could have, but I didn't. Don't do that. Some days now. You don't want to get to the end of your life, look back, with regret, regret, regret. All right, here's the fifth thing, and then you're going to be allowed to hit sin, okay? Here's the fifth thing, and this one's a simple but difficult, all right? That made no sense. Um, here's the fifth one. Tell somebody. Tell somebody. See, we here at Living Water, we believe in life groups. We believe in accountability. We believe in walking with other people. And the big part of that is so that you can tell people and they can walk with you through things. So whatever your excuse is, Whatever the thing is that you constantly say, I will do this when, I'm waiting for when, whatever that fill in the blank is, identify it, investigate it, own up to it, ask yourself the question, what do I lose, 
and then tell somebody. Are you ready? You can hit send on your text message. Send it to yourself. You now have the tools that you need to take with you. Maybe this week, maybe today, maybe in weeks to come, maybe when you find other excuses in your life. And let me sort of wrap up the entire series with a challenge and maybe put a bow on the whole thing. Are you ready? Statement that's going to come up on the screen. It kind of goes our entire series. Stop waiting for when. Stop waiting for when. Stop waiting for when. And make someday now. See, if we consistently wait, if we consistently say, I'll do this when, or I don't want to because, or I'm not willing to, whatever, we're missing out on the fact that we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I've, I've used this a bunch, and I did not first service, and just kind of feel like God wants me to do it again. A lot of you know my story. You've heard me tell my stories forever. I've been doing this a while. Um, my, my dad was killed in a car accident when he was 52 years old. Um, he was in Africa on a mission trip. First ever mission trip he ever went on was there about a week, and they were jumping back in the car to head to the airport to fly from Uganda to Kenya, and there was an accident. My dad was killed in an accident in Africa. Um, my dad was 52 years old when he died. 52. Um, it's this, this is hard because uh, last week I turned 54. I have outlived my dad by two years. Now, I tell that story often, and, and listen, God's done incredible things, and God, a lot of people have come to Jesus through the circumstances and tragedies that have happened in our lives. But at 52 years old, I, I often think about this. Um, when my dad was 26, do you think he knew he was middle-aged? I don't either. See, we don't know when. We don't know when the when ends. But if we are constantly making the excuse of someday, if we're constantly saying to ourselves, I can't because, if we're constantly saying, I I don't want to do this, if we're giving the reasons and the reasons are becoming excuses, we're going to end our life with regret. And here's what I 100% know. You don't know when the last day will be. You don't. You, you have no idea when your last day on this earth will be. And so many people say, I'm going to follow God, and I'm going to make a decision on my deathbed. I just don't know a lot of people who get a deathbed. Because we don't know when. With that in mind, make someday now. Whatever it is in your life, whatever excuse you've come up with, whatever story you're telling yourself, whatever lie you're believing, whatever you're thinking you're missing, God is standing here today and he is saying, my invitation is open. Follow me today. Be all in today. Don't wait for someday because someday is now. Will you close your eyes with me for just a minute? I'm not going to do a call forward invitation sort of a thing, but I want to pray for you this morning. Just everybody's got their eyes closed. Nobody's looking around. Um, No need to be embarrassed. Nobody's going to see anything that's getting ready to happen. Um, I just want to ask you a question. Hopefully you've been here and you've heard all the messages in this series. If you haven't, you can go to our Facebook page and get them there. Um, But even if it's just today and this is your first one, and, and maybe you're going... Man, I'm a person that's given a lot of excuses. I'm a person that I do find myself saying someday or, or I, I'll wait until when. I, 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 I can't because. If that's you and you say, hey, Tony, I, I don't want to do that. I, I really want some prayer. Will you pray for me today that I'll quit making excuses and I'll make someday today? If that's you this morning, will you lift your hand real high just so I can pray for you? Man, that's cool. There's a bunch of you. That's cool. All right, you can put them back down. I just mean it hit well, so good. Now, maybe this morning there's some of you with this whole, anybody still got your eyes closed? Maybe there's some of you this morning that, you know, this whole Jesus thing, you're, you're not quite in. 
And, and listen, we created these environments for you. We want you to be here. We want you to hear about Jesus, and we want you to come to him. But this morning, you may say, I'm not sure about Jesus, and this idea, maybe it's the first time it's ever really hit your heart that it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and it's not of yourself. You're never going to be able to do enough good to earn anything from God because you can't earn anything from God. It's a gift. And this morning you're saying, man, I just need to give my life to Jesus. If that's you this morning, I am praying for you as well. And I would invite you. I'm not going to call you up front, but I would ask you at the end, come talk to me. Come talk to Kyle that will be down front. Go to our New Year desk and just say, I need to know more about being a Christian. Nobody will embarrass you. We'll take you quietly and we'll talk with you about this. Let me pray. God, I love you this morning. Thank you. Thank you that you created us. Um, in, in your word, Jeremiah says, you, you knew us before we were even, you knit us together in our mother's womb. Ah, and you created us. God, I pray that this is the end of our waiting until when. And we begin to recognize that someday is now. No more excuses, no more putting off. But God, completely surrendering our lives to you today. God, will you change people? The ones that raise their hands today, I do sincerely pray for them. God, I pray that whatever excuses, whatever things, that they'll, they'll take that text they sent to themselves this week and say, man, I'm going to take a few minutes every day and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to investigate. I'm, I'm going to identify. I'm going to own up. I, I, I'm, going, I'm, I'm going to look at myself and I'm going to tell somebody I, I'm going to make a change. God, I pray for them. I pray that there is real life change that happens. That if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you, Jesus, please, please, please don't let them leave today without talking to someone about you. Um, I love you. Thank you. Thank you that we get to share. And we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.